morning, good afternoon uh, to everyone who has joined us, wherever you're joining us from. Thank you very much. Welcome to One Quantum Africa meetings. Uh, my name is Farai Majan. Um, I'm a quantum experimental physicist. I graduated from the University of Leeds in 2019. I'm also a um, first runner-up from a Kiskit camp that was hosted in Africa. And I'm now the president of One Quantum Africa, which is a community effort which brings people together across the continent to understand quantum technologies, to collaborate in quantum technologies, and to figure out a role for the continent to play as this technology evolves and moves from the lab to market, as they say. So today we have the pleasure of hosting uh, Professor Andrew Forbes. He's the VITSQ director and the professor at the University of VITS. Uh, so this platform, is made possible by our general sponsors, uh, Vyate Quantum Technologies. And I'm going to give this time up for them to give us a word and to you know open up the platform so that we can take it forward. So thank you very much, Lesedi. Um, you can feel free to unmute yourself and come through. Thank you, Farai. Um, thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, we are delighted to host this week's session, which will allow us to gain uh, invaluable insights from Andrew Forbes, who's a leading figure in the local quantum landscape. At Bayeta Quantum, we believe that the lives of ordinary Africans can be made better by adopting smarter solutions to everyday problems. With this in mind, we recognize the significant potential for quantum solutions that solve challenging long-term problems facing the continent in a broad spectrum of applications spanning from healthcare to payment solutions. Our context indeed presents fundamental and unique challenges, which have resulted in the fact that Sub-Saharan Africa continues today to lag other regions in terms of digital access. But this in turn presents unique opportunities that will allow for Africa to shape the quantum tech landscape going forward. We think that this bright horizon is underpinned by two things in particular, our large and undertapped resource of young and smart people. And secondly, the inherent appropriateness of quantum software development on the continent, as it is relatively low cost, it's scalable, and it can leverage developments in quantum hardware that are made in other regions. We look forward to today's discussion on the exciting research at WITS on quantum, and we'll be keen to hear a little bit more about Andrew's vision for quantum on the continent. With that said, thank you very much for this intro and back to you, Fry. Thank you very much, Sadi. Uh, so let me talk a bit about One Quantum. Uh, so One Quantum Africa is a global, uh, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a continental effort that brings people together around quantum tech. And it is a chapter of One Quantum, which is a global platform uh, that brings people together from all walks of life, the idea is to make people who are interested and active in quantum tech to have opportunities to contribute, opportunities to connect, and opportunities to collaborate. We do this through four you know, pillars, which are communities, which allows us to host events like what we're doing so that we bring people together and we build a platform where people can have conversations uh, from diverse backgrounds and all get to figure out a role to play and how to move this field forward, uh, especially in Africa in, in, in this context. So we also have mentoring uh, that we offer to our members and I'm happy to say members from Africa who successfully applied for this. I think we've got almost five uh, members who have applied for the mentorship. The first call that we made who are already being mentored by quantum tech experts uh, who are, in, you know, some are local and some are global, which is a very interesting opportunity of developing professionally in this space. If ever Africa has to also acquire skills and get knowledge to move this technology forward. We also do have careers where we you know, share open opportunities uh, from the system. And we also collect CVs from people in Africa and we engage with career partners and you know, try to push them to also give people in Africa opportunities to contribute uh, and to get involved in, 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 uh, in actual jobs, in internships, and to, to even support them succeed. We also have projects. We understand that each and every region has got its own you know, uh, problems and challenges. And we are always engaging our communities and you know, supporting them to look at problems that are relevant to their local settings and figure out a role that quantum tech can play. Um, with that, uh, we recently hosted the Quantum in Africa Summit, 
where our speaker today, uh, Professor Andrew Forbes, was also part of. We even invited other speakers across Africa, Professor Ahmed Yunis from Egypt, uh, Morad Taumini from uh, Tunisia, Kabluli Mafu in Botswana, and many other people. Uh, who came as quantum experts in the continent so that we showcase the quantum talent we have. We also learn from experts in the continent that have been working in this field for a long time and we figure out a role that we can play and even students in the continent, like let's say dimension, we've got a very big young population. All these people need the education, especially in important technologies like one. So when they hear from experts who are best here, they realize that there's an opportunity to contribute and they indeed have a role to play. So these are some of the speakers who have come on our platforms, who we have given platforms uh, you know, to share about what they're working on and also a platform to connect with the global community. Um, I'm, I'm actually, you know, it's, this, is, this is a graphic that I like so much. Why? Because if you look at the number of chapters that have been you know, coming up at, at one quantum, like I said, we are decentralizing and building local communities. So the vision is to have a community of one quantum in every country so that people who are, you know, active and interested from every country in Africa and even every country across the world, there's an opportunity to contribute and to participate. So Africa in this case so far has got the most number of uh, chapters thanks to amazing volunteers and, you know, who are stepping up and reaching out to, to us and to me in particular to say, we also want to get involved and there's no way that we can move this conversation forward if we are only going to have one individual representing Africa. So we want more and more people to get involved and please reach out if ever, you know, we are from any of the countries that are, are not indicated there, reach out so that we can talk about it, we can start a chapter. And I'm also happy that all the people that are also from the other countries that are represented, that have chapters that are in place, please rally behind your, your leaders there, support them and you know, figure out a way to get this community to work for you. Um, let me talk about next week. Uh, at the same time, we are going to host uh, William Haley and some of you may have heard about him, but William Haley is a, is a co-founder and general partner at Ecliptic Capital. He's also a founder and CEO at Strange Works. And they are also our partner who allows us to use their streamlined platform to do projects that I mentioned earlier. He has got a quantum uh, computing startup that is based in Austin, Texas. He's a, I like him a lot because he's an open source advocate who is you know, working very hard to make sure that we can access quantum computers on, on the cloud from where we are. And that has you know, changed the game for us in Africa in terms of how we can contribute to this field. We can get access to devices today we can get access to resources today that allows us to develop our capabilities in quantum. Uh, so please, you know, uh, keep this in mind and join us next week um, at, at, at the same time. Let me now introduce uh, Pumzilema Donzela. She is the One Quantum South Africa president. And I'll call her upon to, to come on board and perhaps share about uh, herself briefly and also introduce our speaker of the day. So thank you very much, Pumzile, and uh, the stage is yours. Thanks, Farai. Good evening, good morning, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm very excited to announce uh, South Africa's own chapter, which is a subchapter of One Quantum Africa. Our sole mission is to engage and bring various stakeholders from government, investors, um, enterprises, academia, as we have uh, a, a lot of them in this session, to drive and move quantum tech forward, to join the quantum tech race. Uh, Africa has been left behind in so many races, so I think this is a chance for, for Africa to really uh, join in as quickly as possible. And there's a lot of research groups within the country who have, um, have a, a great footprint of, of quantum information science and um, quite a, a, a lot of work that they've been doing. And certainly the speak of today uh, does have a very substantial work uh, in it. With one quantum SA, perhaps others might say it's only an essay that's uh, maybe prominent within the field, but I need to say that we're, with various chapters, such as one from Zimbabwe headed by Lorraine, they have done successful work in actually gathering like high, high school learners in getting them involved. Uh, also Shannon from Kenya and Abdul from Libya within the ICT space, they're also uh, gearing up how can they have quantum based solutions in, 
and and there um, we we we're very glad uh, that uh, we have all like one quantum a global uh, community that supports us. We are able to do work with this, but I call on everyone, particularly here in South Africa, to please subscribe to our newsletters that you will see various events. We will engage with different stakeholders within SA to see what's the progress, what are the challenges of driving this field forward. Uh, to wrap up then, I'll just move on into introducing our speaker today. Well, our speaker, it's, um, he was, I was fortunate enough during my undergrad studies uh, at the University of the Witwatersrand um, in doing my third year that I actually was instructing one of the courses that I took, which was waves and modern optics. And then also during my honors year, the electrodynamics uh, course, which I received an A from, from it. So he's a, he, he has a much deeper knowledge more than textbook knowledge, which some may think, may think we'll get. But um, today, without further ado, let me just introduce our speaker. He's the distinguished professor at uh, the University of the Witwatersrand. He's where he started a new laboratory that focuses on structured light and its application. He sits on several international conferences, conference committees, and chairs the SI, SPIE International Conference on Laser Beam Shaping, sits on advisory boards for OSA segment schools on lasers, chairs the editorial board of periodical optics. Oh, you don't have to read it out from Zilli, don't worry. <laughs> it's, away, Lord. it's almost every, everything. Now, what's interesting enough is that he's been recently appointed as the director of the Brits Quantum Initiative, a forum for quantum scientists across the continent to connect. I am very excited to hear more about WITSQ. Uh, it's, it's also one thing that's very interesting is that the, the SA government has actually also launched a, the Quantum Initiative Network, which I believe the speaker will talk more uh, about it, uh, hopefully today. So I'll give it over you to you, Prof. Fantastic. Mzili and Farai, thank you so much for the kind introduction. Let me see if I can share my screen. Uh, I think I need some permission to do that. You are good um, to go, Prof. <clears throat> I'm good to go. Uh, you cannot. It says I cannot do it while you're sharing. So maybe... Oh, okay. okay. So let, me, let me stop that. Sorry for that. I actually forgot I was still sharing. No problem. Sure. All right. Good. Yes, that will work. Now give me a second. I'm going to just have to tilt my screen here just to get this. Um... Sit up. Okay. All right. Right. Hopefully, do you see my slides? Yes, they are, they are good. Enough. I can see them. All right. Brilliant. Fantastic. <clears throat> so when uh, Farai asked me to do this, I said I would speak about quantum research at WITS, uh, concentrating on the transition from science to technology. I've put at WITS in, in braces because I'm going to speak a little bit more widely than that and try to give you a perspective from what's happening in South Africa, and what's happening at BRICS, and I won't cover the, the, the international scene because I think that's, that could have been covered in many, many of your talks already. But having said, I'm not going to concentrate too much on WITS. Let me begin with WITS because that is where I'm from, of course. So this is, if you've never been to WITS, it's um, actually very, I think it's a very pretty campus. And this is what it looks like when there are no students around. And in fact, at the moment, there are no students around. So this is the Great Hall, and I'm in the School of Physics, which is a little bit to the left of the Great Hall. And of course, today's talk is about quantum research, and quantum research has a very long history. So <clears throat> you can go back in time, nearly a century, in fact. And of course, it's given rise to technologies that we're all very familiar with, right? Things like the transistor and lasers, which have given rise to all our modern manufacturing, all our modern IT and computing systems. And that, of course, today would be put under the first quantum revolution. And we know very well that we are experiencing a second quantum revolution. And that's why things like entities like one quantum are so popular. And it's because we can now start to harness quantum entanglement as a resource, along with all the things that go with it. And that resource allows us to do cool things, 
from metrology to secure communication, enhanced imaging, uh, quantum sensors, simulations, and of course, computing. So here is a slide that I've taken from one of the many entities that do market research. And I call it the quantum race because lots of countries are putting a lot of money into this. And I question whether it's accurate because it's changing so fast. And it's also a little bit hard to tell the difference between the reality on the ground and the hype. So how much money is real money and how much money is sort of monopoly money that's counted towards a quantum effort. But I think even if you, if you believe that there's a little bit of hype involved here, what is certainly true is that there's a large investment in quantum across the globe. And it doesn't matter where you look. It's just a matter of the scale that you'll find when you look there. Now, coming from South Africa, of course, we have a continental focus. We have a national focus, but we also have a BRICS focus. And I want to start off with BRICS because that naturally lets me end with the S, which is South Africa. So let me, let me do that. And I'm going to do this because actually I presented these next few slides just recently to a BRICS meeting because BRICS too has a quantum effort on the go. So what is the, um, what is the BRICS story? Well, if you look at Brazil, <clears throat> actually they have a very old quantum strategy. It goes back already nearly 20 years. They started very small with a few institutes. They grew it. Today it stands at about 20 institutes across all of Brazil, there are roughly about a hundred researchers and they concentrate on most areas of quantum research from information theory to quantum optics and of course, cryptography and, and communication. What about the, the R, Russia? Russia is a little bit more, more modern. It's about a decade old. And it started off with a, a new quantum center. They had about 30 million euro investment. Here's a picture of it in the background. Very impressive center. Most recently, they have committed to spend about a billion euros on quantum technology going forward. And again, this is going to be focused in things like computing and simulation, communication, metrology, and sensing. Actually, the Russian program is expanding at a phenomenal rate. You can see it both in terms of the number of outputs, publications, and new quantum centers. So quantum in Russia is growing very, very fast. India, India is a, a very recent addition to the, the quantum national um, international race. When I say recent, of course, all countries have a long quantum history, traditionally taught in physics schools and done theoretically with some small experimental, experimental activities. But what I'm talking about here is a national program to drive it strategically. And in that sense, India's program is, is very nascent. So it's only a few years old. It started with um, a commitment by the government to, to have computers and communications at the quantum level in place within 10 years. That was 2018, so that's a very ambitious goal. And then just recently last year, they announced a, a roughly 1 billion US dollar investments over the next five years into quantum technology. And their, their scope covers all of quantum. And here you see it's actually a new research institute in India, and it concentrates entirely on quantum computing. So if you think about the scale of what this is compared to what we're doing, for example, in Africa, then you see the, what the race really means for us. Of course, it will come as no surprise to any of the listeners, I think, that the C in BRICS is by far the largest. And the difference here, and I, I don't have to give you the Chinese numbers except for one, that the Chinese have spent already about a billion dollars. So their spent is already larger than most countries' commitments into quantum. And they started more than 20 years ago. And here in the background, if you look at this beautiful picture, it's the Mesius satellite. It's a quantum, it's one of the nodes of the quantum network. And so I like to tell people, you know, we always speak about this quantum network that's coming, but if you look at this, it's already here. And there's no question that the Chinese are leading this race, particularly in quantum communications. 
Interestingly enough, they're very, very far behind in quantum computing. And I think they're trying to change that. But in the communications aspect, they are leaps ahead. So that's most of the BRICS, except for the S. So what about South Africa? What are we doing? <clears throat> well, our activity started only a few years ago in terms of a national strategy. And we worked together as a consortium of institutes around South Africa to set up a quantum technology roadmap. And the idea was to focus on technology, to make it a national strategy, and to, to make it holistic. So covering all the institutes, what are we strong at? What are we not so strong at? Where, where should we invest our money to get the largest bang for our buck? <clears throat> and what we found is that, well, we've got really good science. So we produce hundreds of beautiful papers. We get lots of good uh, citations. This is over the last few years. We, of course, being in South Africa, we have a strong focus on human capital development. And so we, if you count all the graduated students who have been involved in quantum in one way or another, it exceeds 50 in the last few years with very, very good demographics. You know, lots of international news stories for the quality of the science that we produce. But when you start to look at the technology, well, the story starts to, to crack a little bit. So we certainly have some nice patents. Technology demonstrators, mm, depends how you define them. There's certainly some lab demonstrators of things that we've done, but we haven't really gone through to technologies yet. And lots of training events. So training and human capital development, very, very good, excellent science. But the question that we posed in our strategy is, well, how do we leverage on this excellence for economic impact? You know, we're not going to solve the water problems uh, with quantum technology, but we can certainly solve some, some social problems by, by increasing our economy, getting people employed, turning students into workers, um, turning graduates into entrepreneurs. So this is what we hope to achieve with the national strategy. And so over the period of around 2018 to, to, to actually earlier this year, so about three years, we worked very hard on this. And, and here I summarize what the situation is presently in South Africa. So presently in South Africa, we have some main centers. Not surprisingly, they're centered around the main cities. So up in, in Gauteng, we have uh, you know, strong centers at, at Witz, of course, also at the University of Pretoria, at Namisa. Down in Natal, we have UKZN, of course, Francesco's group, very famous for all their theoretical work and, and some experimental work, particularly around quantum computing. Maybe a little bit less known is the centers around the Cape. So Stellenbosch University have just recently launched the quantum chair in Mark Tain, looking at quantum devices. And UCT have a long history in doing metrology at the quantum level. And then we, we have centers that we would like to work with. And these are centers that want to get into quantum. They have some capability, but not yet in the quantum realm. And the idea is to grow with them in order to, to bring in new nodes. So for example, rather than count all of them, if I look down here at Nelson Mandela University, we have a strong capability in fiber optics. And the question is, could we leverage on that to build a national network that is fiber-based for quantum communications. And it's not just universities, that we really want to, to bring the community together to deliver technologies, we need partners in industry, of course, but we also need partners at strategic centers. So for example, uh, the High Performance Center for Computing, uh, NAMISA for Metrology and Sensing, in the quantum world, most of the standards these days are moving towards quantum as the enabling technology. So that's a natural partner to work with. Sanren have got a huge dark fiber network. Could we exploit that to get banks and universities and strategic centers coupled together to demonstrate the power of quantum before we have a national rollout? And following the Chinese example, there's talk that perhaps we, we could be one of the nodes in this quantum network. It's perhaps not so well known that South Africa has 
a lunar and satellite ranging center just outside Pretoria at Heart of Beers Hook. And that would be, it's, it's there because it faces to the Southern Hemisphere, of course, the Southern half of the universe. And so it's used for tracking satellites as it passes down in, in our part of the world. <clears throat> and so that could be a natural node as part of this quantum network. And likewise, the CSR had at one stage some quantum capability, it sort of passed away, but I think that there is interest to rejuvenate that. And certainly centers like Morocco, who have a long history in, in doing quantum and ICT, could play a, a major role in a, in a quantum environment. So the idea is to be diverse in skills, but inclusive in projects to bring in capabilities to deliver on strategic aims. And so that's what the strategy presently says. I should at this stage mention that the strategy is an open document. It's uh, endorsed by the DSI. I'm going to mention a little bit more about that in the next slide. So what I'm telling you now is not a secret. And if you have not seen this document, I don't think there's any reason why we can't share it with you. Okay, so you can just let me know and I certainly will post it. So here's my little jigsaw puzzle to explain the situation. So the way I see it is, is that we have, we have a lot of potential and the challenge is to, to leverage on that potential. So we have got groups that make devices, at least at some level, maybe not devices that you could deploy at the moment, but they certainly are playing with devices. And we have groups that play with protocols. Protocols are also important. If you want the classical and quantum world to work together, you want to communicate sensibly, you must have a protocol to do it. If you have devices and protocols, you still need infrastructure. You need to be able to get things from A to B and from device to device. So that's important. And then what we said we need, which is maybe a little bit different to most strategies, is that we need legislation. And the idea behind this is to say to the government, look, you know, can we not have some trigger points that says when this happens, that's the point where you need to have quantum in your system by law. For example, if you know that your encryption systems are going to be broken because quantum computing has reached a stage where it can break algorithms, should that be a trigger point to say you should have a fundamentally secure link for your, your sensitive data? Legislation of this nature is very common, but not in the quantum world yet. So legislation and together with it validation to make sure the technology is doing what you want it to do, these are maybe a slightly unusual pillars of our strategy, but we think that they are absolutely essential because if we don't have them, it will be hard to get industry to buy in to take up the technology. So it's no good having lots of people developing technology, but nobody sees the incentive or the need to do it. A little bit of pressure from the government, a little bit of push for the, the benefits of the technology might bring the two worlds a little bit closer. At least that's our thinking. And so the hope is that we can, we can accelerate the uptake of quantum technology. And so by working together strategically, we can bring the technology forward. Uh, by creating the right context, we can accelerate the uptake of this technology. And then, of course, we want to encourage our students and young researchers to take that technology out into the economy and form a quantum industry. That's the hope. A quantum industry for South Africa. And if we can do it in South Africa, there's no reason why we cannot do it on the rest of the continent. And so VITs are going to be leading the implementation of the strategy, only not because we're the best in the country in quantum, but because we were one of the drivers of this national strategy and our research office have a vested interest to see this through. There are other reasons which will become more apparent in the slides to follow. So that's what this slide really says. The strategic content is what I've just mentioned. You know, build critical mass, create the right environment, and fast track South Africa towards a quantum industry. That's what we're trying to do. And this was put to the government late last year, refined a little bit earlier this year, and it was officially approved in March, 
2021, so just a few months back. And just a couple of weeks ago, we received the approval for the first injection of funds to launch the strategy. Now, the strategy speaks of the order of 60 million rands per annum in order to really roll out fully the vision that we have. But what we have at the moment, because we're halfway through this financial year, essentially, is a seed fund to get the implementation going. And so we have an approved seed fund of about 8 million rand, tiny, tiny compared to the international scene, but significant in the South African context. And that seed fund will be deployed strategically. We have flagship projects that cover the spectrum of things that I've mentioned. So validation and metrology, communications, computing and devices. But its main aim is really not the, these flagship projects, but rather to, to develop the full implementation plan to be launched in 2022. So that's, that's our goal. <clears throat> I guess what I'm trying to say is that receiving the 8 million Rand is fantastic news, but it's not the end of the story. It's really not even the beginning of the story. It's really just the statement that now we have a lot of work to do in the next one, nine months in order to convince the government that we really can do this, that we can give them value for their money and that their money will be well spent. All right, so that's the S in BRICS. So let me wrap up then the BRICS story. And I wanted to kick off with BRICS because within the BRICS community, we have working groups. And some of these working groups are science and technology focused. One of them is focused on photonics. And within the photonics working group, we have been asked to develop a quantum strategy for BRICS. And the quantum strategy for BRICS, the idea behind it is to be focused on quantum photonic technologies. So if you don't work in photonics, let me tell you very quickly that it's Photonics means harnessing and exploiting photons, which are particles of light. So you can think of it as light-based quantum technologies. Uh, to give you an example, the, the modern quantum computers that you all read about in the news, they are mostly based on solid state technologies, superconducting qubits and the like. But you could do it photonically. In fact, Jeremy O'Brien has just raised in the order of 200 million US dollars to make waveguide path entangled photons, um, promising 10,000 such qubits in about five years. So photonics is certainly a pathway to realize quantum technologies, and BRICS are asking for a quantum strategy based on photonic technologies. The timeline is actually extremely tight. So we have only a couple of months left to wrap this up. And then it's going to be presented jointly to the presidents of BRICS, I guess, through many subcommittees. So there is a wider view than just South Africa. And the hope is that if we can leverage on all our partners, particularly the, the Chinese, we could maybe accelerate even faster our progress towards deployment of these technologies. So giving you the bigger picture from South Africa out to BRICS, let me now zoom in a little bit back towards WITS. So because of the interest in quantum as a national strategy, so just to reiterate, it's now on the national agenda as something of strategic importance. We, of course, think at WITS that is also very, very important. Um, I mentioned, I, I think I actually failed to mention in my slide showing you Vitz that we have our centenary coming up. So Vitz is about 100 years old. And the question that we like to pose is, well, what should we do for the next 100 years? And we believe that quantum should be one of the flagship projects that we drive. And to that end, we launched this new initiative. I call it an initiative because it's not really a group. It's not really an institute. We don't really have critical mass and quantum skills yet at WITS to the point where you could say this is a huge entity. And so for me, it's an initiative to get quantum going at WITS. 
And what does this initiative hope to do? Well, it hopes to encourage research, um, innovation, of course, because the focus is on technology again, not science, although it's not that science is not important. You don't get innovation and technology without good science. So research, innovation, business, and even things that you may not initially associate with quantum, things like, like business, um, ethics, what are the ethics around doing imaging or, or breaking codes and doing encryption and so on. So we have a, a very diverse set of partners in what we call WITS-Q, the WITS Quantum Initiative. And it's very interesting because most of them are not from the School of Physics. The scientists who work in quantum are mostly physicists still, but the people most passionate about quantum education actually come from engineering. And the people most interested in applying quantum technology come from health. In fact, the health members of this of WITSQ far outnumber the physicists. And I think that's absolutely fantastic because, you know, it's very exciting to see people outside your field share their excitement on what you could do with it. <clears throat> and so let me, rather than unpack all of these subfields, let me just look at the research part. And so what are we trying to do? So, of course, quantum communication, that's something that we, we do quite a lot of at WITS. Quantum imaging is a new emerging field with many, many applications. And in fact, in today's talk, I'm going to touch a little bit on this quantum imaging. Quantum health, well, quantum health is not a phrase you will see in any national strategy that I've seen so far, but we've decided to put it in there. And we put it in because we've, we feel that this is the future. This is where we could make a huge impact. So to bring quantum technologies into the world of health. And I'll give you an example a little bit later of where we could do this. Quantum computing is very big, of course. We have a strong group working on sensors and devices, um, people making, and that's solid state based actually. And then traditionally through school of physics and related disciplines, we have a lot of quantum science, theoretical and experimental. I mentioned the quantum computing has been very big and that's because just down the road from WITS, we have IBM, they have their research center in South Africa sitting uh, literally a kilometer or less actually down the road from us. And so there are many opportunities to collaborate and grow that. And that is an example of where we think nationally, but also within WITS, that we could, I wouldn't call it leapfrog the competition. I, I prefer to call it sidestep the competition. And to give you an example, our national strategy says we will not build a quantum computer. So we specifically say that is not part of the strategy. And the reason is that it's just too expensive. Even if we got it right, we, we wouldn't be able to throw the money at it that other people are, are throwing at it. We'd never be able to really compete and be, you know, make an impact if we spent our money in that way. On the other hand, if you think of smartphones, the industry around smartphones centered on applications, so apps, is huge. In other words, you don't have to be able to build a smartphone to be part of the smartphone economy. And we think the same with quantum computers. You don't have to build a quantum computer to be part of the quantum computing economy that could come in the future. And so we call it quantum apps. Could we not train people to develop the applications that use quantum computers across a range of fields? Um, from finance to drug discovery. And in fact, we're working with the process engineering department at FITS to look at how you could write applications to solve their problems faster and a little bit more efficiently. So quantum apps would be a way of sidestepping all the huge financial and technological hurdles you would have to overcome to enter the real race for the device itself. So yes, the many opportunities uh, and partnering with IBM is, of course, very important to do that. So at this point, <clears throat> I've given you a little bit of a flavor of what we're doing nationally and what FITSQ is planning to do internally. And it's really just to create an environment 
to bring more participants into quantum. And now at this point, I'd like to zoom in a little bit more and come into my own group. So I know that there's quite a lot of researchers who are listening here. And so I'm going to give you a few slides that are a little bit more on the science side of things, but I'm going to keep it at a very high level. If you would like more technical detail, you can just shout and I, and I, and I bombard you with, with, the, with the nitty gritty, but hopefully you get a flavor at the end of this about what we do. So if you go into the School of Physics, which is where I sit, then I run a group called Structured Light. And if you were to come into my lab, then this is what it would look like. Lots of lasers and light beams bouncing around. And in the back of this lab, there are some very dark rooms. And inside these dark rooms, <clears throat> we do our quantum experiments and we generate entangled photons. And why do we call it Structured Light? And what do we even mean by Structured Light? So have a look at these very pretty patterns. What they are is not important. These are patterns of light. You see that there are many of them. In fact, if you go to a primary school and you ask one of the children, how many patterns do you think there are? Well, of course they'll say countless. So we have countless patterns that we can create. And in our lab, we create them with these holograms. The, the essence is that we can create arbitrary patterns of lights. And then we use these patterns of light. So where would we use them? Well, one way is to form an alphabet. So if you imagine that each pattern, for example, could be the letter A or the letter B or the letter C, I can form an alphabet out of patterns of lights and I can communicate with that alphabet. <clears throat> and one of the ways we like to communicate, of course, is at the quantum level. So let me unpack that a little bit and explain what I mean. So imagine that I wanted to send an image like the one you see here of Maxwell. Well, I could encode the different pixels as patterns. I could send them across some channel. It could be optical fiber. It could be underwater or in free space or to satellites. It doesn't really matter. I send these patterns across the channel. I detect them on the other side. And so I receive the information. And the idea in the classical world is that the more patterns you can use, the so you, you can increase the bandwidth of the present communication systems. Um, <clears throat> it's not quite as simple as what I'm going to say next, but you can think of it like this. If you have a particular bandwidth going down optical fiber, at the moment we use one pattern down the fiber. If we could get 100 patterns to work down the fiber, we could increase the bandwidth by a factor of 100. So that's the kind of motivation for using patterns of light. We call it mode division multiplexing. It, in, in simple English, it means use the modes, the patterns, to increase the, the communication that you can have with your present channels. And so if I, for example, do this practically in our lab, I can take pixels encoded in all sorts of weird patterns. In this case, it's over 100 channels of patterns. And so we have 100 times the speed that we would have had, and so we can send information. And what we want to do is we want to do this not only classically to make the communication faster, but we want to do it at the quantum level to make it fundamentally secure. And to drive home the idea that we are interested in science to technology, here you see a device that we've made, and what this device is doing is it's actually sending information over a link. Actually, this this is just a demonstration over about 100 meters, but you see it's a, it's a practical photonic device that does it. And in the quantum world, we know that the more patterns we use, the more information we can pack into the light. But the question is, how far can we go with those patterns? And, and that's the research question that we have to answer. So where does the quantum come into all of this? <clears throat> well, in our lab, what we do is we use a very simple nonlinear process to generate entangled photons. And so very typically a workhorse in our lab would be that we'd have an ultraviolet photon. So an ultraviolet photon of light hits the crystal, a nonlinear crystal, and out come two infrared photons, and these infrared photons are entangled. That means that they share correlations that cannot be explained by any classical theory. Okay, so we 
we can generate entangled photons. Where, where do the patterns come into all of this? Well, have a look here. Here's my cartoon of the crystal with the photon coming in and out go the two infrared photons shown as the red lines here. And now I send them to two devices that can look for patterns of light. <clears throat> and I can use any patterns I want. So here are some sets, which we call the Hermite modes. And here are the Ligier Gaussian modes. These are details that are not important. What's important is that there are in principle an infinite number of patterns. And the wonderful thing about the quantum world is that you get whatever you measure. So if I choose to measure in a basis that's described by patterns, well then that's what I get my entanglement expressed as. And so I like to call this quantum mechanics with pictures of lights, because it's literally just patterns of lights that give me access to high dimensions. Uh, we have a favorite pattern. <clears throat> it's called orbital angular momentum. So you know if you have planets orbiting the sun, that is an example of something that carries orbital angular momentum. And if you go to your textbook blob of light, so here's a, a false color image of a blob of light, then it doesn't carry any orbital angular momentum. <clears throat> but if I give this light a twist and I twist it one uh, unit, one twist per unit wavelength, then what happens is that the wave fronts or the, the planes of constant phase, they become helical. So I get this helical type light. And because the phase is helical, what happens is that on the center, the phase is not defined. So I get a hole in the middle of the beam and I get a ring of light. And this beam will carry one unit or one H bar per photon of orbital angular momentum. But I only twisted once per unit wavelength. I can actually twist it twice. Well, now the helical pattern becomes a little bit more complicated. It's got like a double helix. I get a bigger hole in the middle of the beam, but now I get two units of H bar. And I can do it three times. And you see that now I have something like fuzzy pasta. It's a very beautiful uh, structure and I have a big hole in the middle. And if you've been paying attention and you haven't wandered off to have a glass of wine, then you would have realized that I always twisted it in the clockwise direction. So I can actually change that and twist in the opposite direction. And if I go in the opposite direction, then I get negative values of orbital angular momentum. So you see that in principle, I can go from minus infinity to plus infinity. So I have an infinite number of patterns based on this orbital angular momentum of lights. And how does this relate to the entanglement? Well, let's go back to my cartoon. So here's my blob of light. It doesn't carry any angular orbital angular momentum. I send it into this crystal. Out come two photons. They're going to be entangled. And I'm going to show you how and why. So let's say that the top photon has an orbital angular momentum of plus one. Well, orbital angular momentum must be conserved. That means that since the pump has got zero, the sum of these two, the two photons that came out must also add to zero. So if that's plus one, then this one has to be minus one and vice versa. Or if this one's two, then this one must be minus two. And if I write down the quantum states, the possibilities, well, it's one or minus one, but also minus minus one, one, and two, minus two, and so on, then basically any quantum theorist will immediately recognize that, ah, that is a high dimensional quantum state. And so that's how expressing the entanglement and patterns lets you access high dimensions. And the higher the, the dimensions, the more information you can pack into the lights, the, the better the security is, the more robust it is to noise. So you have many, many benefits. And then on the technical front, of course, we need to be able to detect these patterns of light. And that's very easy. If I can create a pattern by sending a blob of light through some device to get the pattern, then from the reciprocity of light, I can just bring it backwards. And then by coupling this into a single mode fiber, I have a pattern sensitive detector. And so to put this into the lab, what does it mean? I take my two photons to devices that could 
and recognize the patterns. And then I change what I look for on these devices. So I change the pattern I'm looking for. I say, look, are you three twists or are you four twists or are you one twist and so on. And I measure in coincidence. I look at what the two photons say. And a very typical picture would be something like this. And, you know, my mother could have predicted this picture because all it says is, you know, if you have two numbers and they have to add to zero, what are the possibilities for what they are? And it's very simple, right? So if one of the numbers is 10, then you can read it up. Well, then the other one must be minus 10. And if this one is, is um, you know, 15, then this one must be minus 15. And so you have the strong anti-diagonal. And you see that in our lab, typically we get about 20 modes, patterns of light that we can use. And so if you didn't know it before, then I can tell you now that you know, um, infinity, which is what I told you you could get with patterns, is about 20. And you might say, oh, well, 20 is very far from infinity. And that's true, it is. But it's also an order of magnitude bigger than two. And two is what you get by using polarization of lights. So if you look at the textbook examples of doing entanglement and quantum optics with light, it's usually polarization. And we can do 10 times better than that as a kind of rule of thumb. And so that's why we can do cool things. And I'm not going to speak at all about communications because I think not so long ago, Isaac Nape gave a talk on the communications work from my group. But if you have a look at this very pretty um, journal cover picture, it shows that you can go to 11 dimensions and distribute a quantum secret across 10 parties and here we're trying to depict graphically that it's patterns of light that let you send a quantum key across these parties so you can do really cool things in communication but i don't want to speak about communication i want to spend the last five minutes just talking about another aspect that i think is really exciting and that is to look at imaging so we have these two entangled photons and now let's see where they arrive. <clears throat> so as the photons come out of the crystal, they arrive randomly in each place. But even though their arrival position is random, their positions are correlated because of the entanglement at the crystal. And what that means <clears throat> is that I can use these correlations to do imaging. And this is called um, quantum ghost imaging. So here's how it works. Here's my crystal again. Here's my UV photon coming into it. And here's one of the entangled photons. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put an object in this arm. But I'm going to make sure that the detector is bigger than the object. So in other words, if a photon gets through the object, it gives a click. But I couldn't have told what the object was because the bucket is bigger than the object. So you, you can't say anything about the shape of the object. So this arm has got no information about the object. And now what about the other photon? Well, the other photon goes off to the opposite direction of the room. And it of course never sees this object, which is here. So it also doesn't have any information about the object. And on this arm, I'm going to put a camera and I'll measure in coincidence. So each arm has got no information at all about the object. So what happens when we watch in coincidence? Well, what happens is that the photons arrive randomly, but as the picture builds up, <clears throat> you can see that we see the object being revealed. And in this case, it's a mask of a little ghost. And so on the camera over here, the camera on the arm that never sees the object reveals an image of this object. And so this is quantum imaging. And we can understand how to go further than using a camera. And this is work that was inspired by our Scottish collaborators. They have this idea of going to a single pixel detector, a detector with no resolution. And I want to explain in simple terms how it works, the way I, and I like to think about it is that, well, how does a camera work? It works that here's your pixel array of the camera, and I can write it as a, as a sum of 
well, how much information is in this pixel and how much information is in that pixel and so on. And because the pixels are orthogonal, so if I look at their overlap, it's zero unless you have the same case, then this forms a nice way to express an arbitrary picture. And I can generalize that to random patterns. So instead of saying just one pixel, why don't I make these random patterns? And so on my detectors over here that I had before, what I'm going to do is I'm going to load random patterns and detect with just a single pixel. So I want an image of something, but on a camera that only has one pixel. So can that work? Well, yes, it does. So here you see some of the images and maybe it's better if I show you the video. So as we run the masks, we have an object in the one arm of a Lambda and slowly we see it emerging on the other arm through a reconstruction process. So what that means is that we can do quantum imaging where firstly the photon never interacts with the object and where we don't even need a camera on the other side. So you can see the power of that. Then of course you can do some cool things. You can, for example, add intelligence to the system. So I won't bore you with the details of the slide, but what it says is that you can also say, well, why don't I do some machine learning and artificial intelligence to recognize what the object is. And so we've been playing around with quite a lot of that. So of course, students love to do machine learning these days. And so we can have an intelligent quantum camera that looks for things. And our most recent advance that I want to just show you in one slide, and I'm, you'll be happy to know I'm gonna to come to the end shortly, is you could say, well, you know, do you gain anything over the classical world? I mean, if you just used normal light and a normal camera, you know, couldn't you have done everything you just did now? Well, there, there are two differences. The one is that by making my camera intelligent, I can stop the experiment after just a few photons. So I can image with very, very low levels of light. But there's something else I can do. So these two photons are entangled. In my cartoons, they were the same color, but they don't have to be. So I could, for example, make the photon that passes to the objects, I can make it deep in the infrared, and I could make the photon that goes to the camera in the visible. So why would that be interesting? Well, anyone who's shown a torch on your hand will know that it looks really red, and that's because red light penetrates much farther into tissue than invisible light. Um, if you've ever looked through tinted glass, you know that with your eye detecting in the visible, you can't see through the tinted glass. But if you had an infrared beam, you could. You must have seen these science fiction movies where they had the thermal cameras and they can see through the, the glass. Well, what, what this camera would do is I could probe living tissue, for example, in the infrared, but get images on the visible detector. Or I could probe an object behind some tinted glass and I could get images in the visible. And in fact, if you look at the news that's, that's online, you'll see some beautiful examples of that. We've just published it um, very recently. I was gonna show you a few cool things, but I think actually in the interest of time and to stimulate discussion, I'm gonna skip it because it's not really important. And I'm going to end here and say, I've tried to, in this talk, uh, give you a little bit of strategy, a little bit about what's happening in BRICS, what's happening in South Africa, and a little bit of science. And if the science was a little bit fast, then you can read this recent review that we wrote, which puts into perspective what you can do with structured light and how quantum comes into the story. I want to, to end by mentioning that Although I focused on WITS and South Africa, of course, our national strategy and WITS Q as well speaks to the entire continent. In fact, WITS uh, pays for the IBM subscription to the quantum computing system and has made it free for all African institutes. So any African institute can access that system because of what we've done at WITS. Our national strategy speaks to leveraging on what we're going to do nationally and taking it out to the continent to work closely with other countries who also have national strategies, like for example, Rwanda and our, our North African neighbors. 
And I specifically want to mention, here's my little group. We're, we're very young and enthusiastic, and we are always hosting visitors from across the continent. One of the things we have in the present seed fund is the ability to bring in people to work closely and to, to get enthusiasm and new researchers into quantum. And so if you're interested in really working in quantum entanglement as experimental resource in the lab, then please come and contact me. And I think on that note, I'm going to end by saying that um, you can go to the WITSQ webpage. You'll find lots of cool things there. You can come to our webpage and you'll also find some cool resources. And really, please come and contact us. We, we want to expand our network. We want to grow together and we welcome all collaborations. Thank you very much, uh, Andrew, for, for this uh, beautiful presentation. And uh, I say that because I'm the host, <laughs> but because those are the kind comments we've been getting from the chat. Um, so I'll quickly turn to the chat and uh, try to pick uh, on the questions that have been coming through as you did your presentation. Um, one of them was uh, from Daniel. Um, how would photonic technology survive the challenges of uh, the photons per get fidelity due to their non-interactive nature? <clears throat> so that was a <clears throat> question. I don't know if you want to get it over there. No, it's, it's a great question, you know, and, and I, I'm a, although I, I work in photonic technologies, I don't believe for a moment that photonic technologies will hold the answer to all the quantum problems that we have to solve. So as you said, photons are weakly interacting, that makes them, and they're very fast, which makes them fantastic for communication, makes them awful for quantum memory, right? You can't keep them still. So I, I really believe that hybrid solid state photonic technologies is the way to go. And so I, I, I strongly encourage people to work on all the pathways to the final solution. I couldn't tell you today which one's going to win for a particular technology. Okay, sounds good, uh, thank you. Uh, then Dev uh, from India is asking, is there a quantum teleportation project now or in the future? Uh, I hope you... Are they quantum? Is there teleportation? Any... Yes, teleportation project now or in the future. <laughs> yes, it's a it's a great question. Um, I, I earlier I, I saw Steph's name on the list. I'm not sure if you're still here, but we have a we have a collaboration with some people. And in fact, in our lab, if you were to come into our lab at this very moment, we have a quantum teleportation experiment running. So, and the slides I skipped at the end are actually quantum and it's entanglement swapping and teleportation. So yes, it's a cornerstone of a quantum network. It's uh, something that we do and many other groups around the world. It's still very much in the lab, but of course that's the dream, right? To take the science through to technology. Sounds good. Um, then Gift is asking, what impact does the Shaw's algorithm have in photonics? I guess it's related to communication. Yeah, security. great question, right? So, so it's, a, it's an algorithm that's typically run on quantum computers and <clears throat> it's ideal for factorization of large numbers and finding the primes. We have actually, we've actually spent an, an entire week. It was, it was a great, great fun week actually at a game reserve trying to see whether we could implement Shaw's algorithm classically with lights. And we have some cool ideas but I don't think that they're realizable anytime in the near future. But there's no reason why it cannot be done photonically. And in fact, many of the experiments, the early experiments were photonic experiments. So yes, you know, how you, how you realize your qubits, it doesn't matter as far as Shaw's algorithm is concerned, so long as you can do all the gates yeah. and we can do them photonically. Okay. Uh <clears throat> Uh, then Sonia that um, says, awesome talk, Andrew. Is it possible to use quantum imaging for medical imaging of patients in poor countries or in a place without suitable setups and the camera will be in a developed country in a faraway hospital? Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a brilliant question. So in fact, we are, we are working with a small technology, black owned technology startup company to, to take this technology out of our lab 
and their interest is actually not quantum at all. Funny enough, it's it's um, to do with road safety. It's a long story, mm-hmm. but yes, our aim is, and I have a student working on this, is to image living systems, to probe them deeply, particularly systems that are very light sensitive, and so to combine the intelligence with machine learning, the low light levels of quantum, the non-interacting nature to show that you can, and then go onto a visible detector to show that you can image deep into living systems. So that's what our present project is about. And yeah, the dream is that you can take this as a device. Um, I call it an intelligent quantum microscope. And, and I do believe that that is the future. Whether it could be a, a device that you could access remotely um, I guess there's no reason why you couldn't. You know, if you're accumulating the image on the detector, then it's just a matter of, of relaying that by a classical link to wherever the doctor happens to be. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and she, she seems very happy with your response as well. Um, Professor Murad Tomini from um, Tunisia is asking, are you considering EPR a type loop for free experiment with your entangled photons? We are not at the moment, but having said that, our, one of our collaborators is Thomas Conrad down in Durban, and he's got all sorts of fantastically exotic ideas on, on bell tests and, and loophole free tests. And we are, I like to think of ourselves as his experimental arm, just as he is our theoretical arm, Thomas and Steph for that matter. So, so yeah, so every time he comes up with a crazy idea and, and he is certainly thinking along those lines, you know, we're always keen to try it out. So we're not ourselves driving that, but he certainly is. Okay, then. thank you very much for that. Um, Pumzile had a question earlier about, uh, I think when you were sharing your slide about uh, the engagement strategy with government and the stages that you have proposed, uh, you know, we have to, to go through as, as, as you move this forward. Uh, her question was, at what stage is, is VIT at the moment uh, in terms of that, uh, you know, in terms of those milestones? We've just got the, the contract from the DSI, in fact, yesterday, and or perhaps this morning, I don't remember, but basically this week. So the seed fund will start to roll out in the next week, <clears throat> and that will get some initiation going with projects. And then we plan to sit with, go with the DSI to other key departments, like, like our trade and industry department, to get them to buy into this whole, let's create an environment conducive to quantum technology been seen through. So we are very, very early days of all of this. <clears throat> Internally at WITS, at WITS Q, our main focus right now is education. Get, get the health people to a level where they can really participate in the way that they want to and get people talking. So internally, it's education, critical mass capacity building. Externally, it's get the environment set up and ready and then hopefully we can run. Sounds good. Interesting progress. Uh, Rob has got a question. Andrew, does South Africa have any niche industrial areas that we want to drive? I accept we are not building a quantum computer. I, th- I feel that the lowest hanging fruit is metrology. <clears throat> and the reason for that is we've got a strong metrology center. They are definitely the leaders on the continent. They interact widely continentally. They interact widely internationally. The idea of validating quantum technology is very much in its infancy. Everybody's working on developing the technology, but not paying a lot of attention to, well, how do you check that it's really doing what it's meant to do? And so my personal feeling is that that is the way to go. That, that's probably going to be the lowest hanging fruit for us. <clears throat> And it's where we have the best potential to make, make an impact. Okay, and, and I'll throw in another one, uh, which I think perhaps it could help a lot of uh, the other people who are also joining us here as well. So I, I know you, you've got also a rich history, you know, working outside the academia, working in business, uh, and, and in, 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 in converting most of these research outputs into products and services. Uh, 
when you were interacting and part of this discussion, interacting with government players, easy. What has been the takeaways? If somebody from another country would want to start a conversation in this direction, what are the what do you think are the immediate points they want to keep in mind as well in order to you know just you know um, get this conversation happening and Pepsi set it up for success? I think you know. What, what we learned in the discussion with the governments, they kept coming back to the same question, you know, how, how are you really going to make a difference given how little money we could put in compared to, you know, the first slide that everybody shows, including me, which look at the billions of dollars that everybody's spending. You know, how can you, they, they use the phrase leapfrog. How can you leapfrog the competition? And, and I've replaced it by saying, well, we can't, right? We're not going to beat people but we can sidestep. And so it's about trying to identify a niche and being honest about what you really can do and where do you really have skills. So it could be that if you have no infrastructure or no quantum track record, perhaps what you're saying is, well, we'll just, have, we'll just be intelligent buyers. We, we'll make sure that we can use other people's technologies and we'll create an industry from that. But if you have got some skill, then think about how you could maybe steer it. And, and our government really made us think about that. You know, they didn't want you to just say, well, we'll give you more money and you do more of the same. It had to be something different. And one of our stories to them, because the money was going to be small relative to everybody else, and that would be true everywhere in Africa, right? I mean, it, the intervention for whatever it is you wanted to achieve couldn't be money. So it can't be, give me more money and then everything will be right. And we said to them, no, our intervention is not so much the money. It's the environment, the legislation. You need to do something as well. And what we want from you is not just your money. And, and I think that's, that really helped us to move forward with them. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just take one last one. Sorry, Daniel, may you mute yourself? Thank you. Uh, I'll take one last one. So what's the biggest hurdle, uh, Jason uh, Webster says, what's the biggest hurdle to South Africa creating practical quantum technologies that we can put on the market right now? <laughs> <laughs> well, it would be great if people like Jason stayed in, in science and quantum research. That would make a massive difference for one. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Look, we need, we need good people, right? And Africa tends to lose a lot of good people. We need them to be working here. And we need, we need people to break out of their silo. This is not a story that's particular to South Africa, but it's important to South Africa and Africa because I showed you some of the institutes in those slides and well, yeah, no, you already have crit critical mass in just one building. You know, if I took all the quantum, some researchers in, in South Africa together, we couldn't even fill one floor of one of those buildings. And so we need to work together. And, and that's the challenge, is getting people to agree to shift their focus to good. If we can get that right, and that's what we have to get right, then we can make a difference. Thank you. And I agree with you. We've got so much distributed strength and, uh, you know, more collaboration is required to move this forward. So I'll quickly take you through a lightning round so that we just finish off on a, on a lighter note um, and uh, get to the conclusion of the meeting. So um, we always want to do this with all our you know, speakers. There's always an important opportunity to learn, you know, uh, so one or two ideas about, you know, about life on this. So, um, Unfortunately, the first one will be quantum related. So what is the biggest misconception that you always have to fight off about quantum technologies in Africa as an expert in this field? I, I know you go through a lot of conversations with different people. Um, <clears throat> look, I mean, obviously people are always surprised to hear that we even do quantum stuff in Africa, right? <laughs> so, people have this feeling that we have so many other problems that you know we shouldn't be worried about things like that. But, but I always tell, whenever I speak to journalists, I always tell them, look, you know, South African, and I speak for South African science, but South African science is as good as anyone else's. It's just that we have less of it. 
And the same would be true for, for the rest of Africa. I think what we can do is as good as anywhere else, but we just have less of it. And so we have to work harder to get it out there. Thank you. Um, I know you've got a lot of work to be doing in quantum, a lot of exciting things we saw from your presentation. But I'm wondering, what are the books do you read which are not related to quantum? <laughs> I read very, very widely. Um, and I read, a, a, I'm a typical physics nerd, I guess, because I read a lot of science fiction and fantasy and, yeah. Okay, sounds good. Um, what is your favorite piece of technology right now that is helping you to get by and you are like blown away? Perhaps we can borrow from you. <laughs> <laughs> you do you know, I, I tell you something, I don't use any technology at all. I don't do any social media. I do no technology at home. My daughter is the only one who knows how to operate my phone and the remotes of our TV. So I, I stay away from technology. I do enough of it at the office. Sounds good. Sounds good. So um, what would be, um, be you know, your, your career advice to young people who are listening and who may want to you know, figure out a way to, to move forward as well? I think what's important is to, whatever you choose to do, make sure you do it really well. I mean, as you said yourself, Rai, I started an industry and now I'm running a quantum optics lab at, at WITS. So it doesn't matter what route you take through life. Um, what matters is that each of those steps that you take, that you do them really, really well, as well as you can. Um, and if you do that, then, then you're going to be successful regardless. Thank you. Uh, and perhaps, uh, if I can have one last one, this one is, 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 an, is an additional one. But what optimizes one for success in a field like quantum tech from your experience? My view is, which is a little bit different to most people, I guess, is that the the important thing in science in general, not just quantum, is creativity. So creativity is often overlooked in science. We tend to concentrate on the skills, you know, the mechanics. And that's very important, of course. If you don't have the toolbox, you can't do anything. But, but creativity, it's, it's so, so important. Asking the right questions, working on the right things. And creativity is something that can be taught. You know, and so I actively try to to get my group engaged on let's think creatively and we do it consciously. We don't just hope that it happens. Yeah. So for me, that's, I would encourage all young people think about creativity. What can you do to be more creative and, and harness it as a skill that you have to develop. Thank you very much for your time, Andrew. And I'm just wondering what's the best way for people to keep in touch with you? I guess they, they want to reach out to you. They can email me. They can email me directly. I think they probably, you can get my email address off our webpage or even VITSQ. You can drop me a message and you know, following that, we can have a chat online or you can come visit us depending on what it is that you're interested in doing. Thank you very much. And I encourage you to connect with Professor Forbes. I've, I've known him for a long time and he's a very nice person. And when he's saying you can visit him, please take that up. And if you ever you can, when the world opens, please make it a point and visit their, their space and fits. And um, um, all the best, Andrew, on what you're working on. We hope to stay connected and to you know, figure out a way to partner and work together to build the quantum ecosystem in Africa and we'll always be happy to hear your ideas and to get, you know, uh, to know your inputs as well, to get your inputs on how we can do this, um, just like you've done ever since we got to know each other. So thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Farai. Great initiative that you've got. It's fantastic. I appreciate it. And I know it's after dinner, but we've got a cocktail for those who have time. Please uh, come and let's talk one on one. But otherwise, thank you very much for joining. I appreciate it. Uh, have a great evening, a great morning, and a great afternoon, wherever you are. So, thank you so, so much. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Thank you, Andrew. So, I'm, I'm going to keep this uh, open for a while to allow you to get, uh, you know,
I'm sorry, we can't hear you clearly. Sorry for that. Um, you could type your message because it seems the network has issues. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Tariq. It's good to see you. Thank you. Um, Fishao. Uh, you know, thank you, everyone. Actually, I, I won't be able to say all the names Robert, Francis, Nadia, Gifts. Um, yeah, I really appreciate that you guys took your time to be with us tonight or to depending on where you are this afternoon, this morning, and uh, this evening. Um, please, um, grab the link for the cocktail. Let me try to pick it up again. Lorraine shared it so that I can, you know, share it one more time. Um, I encourage you to join this. It's, it's always exciting. Try it out, and you won't you won't regret. Believe you me, for those that have tried it out, they're always you know coming back and they've got kind comments about it. So please try it if you have time. But I will appreciate and understand if you you can make it. I know I've got a lot of things happening as well. And feel free to unmute and always say hi and on your way out. So I appreciate it as well. <laughs> uh, hey, Ferai. It was a pretty awesome session. And thank you for organizing this. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining. I know it's a bit late in India, but... You always make it a point to come and support us. I really appreciate it. Makes it truly global. Hello. Sorry, my... Yes, Daniel, my, no my, worries. My, <laughs> my, my, I didn't know it was on mute. <laughs> I was so no, embarrassed. <laughs> no worries, no worries, man. It's, it's part of business. It's, it's part of it. Don't worry about it. Don't, don't think too much about that was, it. It, it happens. So bad. <laughs> Not so even. Bad. Not I, I was even. a bit late during this session, but thank God I was able to meet some of the wonderful um stuff yes he shared you know it was it was it was amazing it was amazing you know there are a lot of things i've actually i, I don't know for, for 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 most of us that are here for the first time there are a lot of mm -hmm. things i've actually personally that i've learned from um one quantum weekly event you know 